The Great Plains, as they appeared around 1840, now stretch out before us. To most Americans living in the eastern states, this territory seemed like an inhospitable desert, unfit for human habitation. Only the bold frontiersmen, rugged trappers, traders journeying to Santa Fe, New Mexico, and a handful of army officers who had ventured into these vast prairies recognized their immense potential, even if only in a vague sense. At the time, this land still appeared desolate, barren, and sparsely populated, inhabited primarily by its native Indian tribes. Much of it remained uncharted, known only to itinerant hunters. While the Missouri River had been explored, and some mountain men had created a passable trail along the Platte River, and traders had carved a path to Santa Fe across the prairies and deserts, the settlements were few and far between. Some log shanties and a handful of fortified forts, established for trading with the Indians, could be found scattered along the larger streams between the Missouri River and the Rocky Mountains. However, they were like tiny dots in the vast expanse. In the eastern regions of Kansas and Nebraska, a few resilient settlers were beginning to establish homes, but they were cautious and rarely ventured far from the Missouri River's site. In Texas, settlements had been made possible through a determined struggle against Mexico, but these had little direct impact on the destinies of the more northern plains. In an effort to safeguard the Santa Fe trade, the government had established the military post of Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Apart from this and the narrow passages mentioned earlier, the Great Plains remained a domain of untamed wilderness, awaiting conquest and reclamation. The men and women tasked with this colossal mission were now turning their adventurous gaze westward. The true beginning of this contest can be traced back to the initial trickle of emigrants heading toward the Pacific coast. It gained momentum with the outcomes of the conflict with Mexico. The former directed people's attention to the idea of establishing permanent settlements in the Northwest, while the latter introduced a new perspective on the potential of the Southwest to the broader population. This marked the moment when the curtain was slightly raised and the era of exploration transitioned into a struggle for territory that preceded permanent settlement. The early stages of this new movement, though distinctive, were characterized by slowness and uncertainty. However, within a relatively short time frame, considering the context of a nation's history, the initial small wave had transformed into a powerful force. Trappers, traders, soldiers, and emigrants, each in their own time, ventured along the obscure wilderness trails, leaving behind the remnants of campfires, deep wagon ruts, and the haunting traces of battles. They consistently paved the way for a growing number of settlers, continually expanding the horizons and revealing the reality of the land. This period, marked by Indian wars and the migration of pioneers, represents the second phase in the narrative of the Great Plains. To present this accurately, we must step back a bit before the specified date, because as early as 1834, there were travelers other than traders or trappers who journeyed along the scarcely discernible trail leading to the distant Oregon. These trailblazers were the vanguards of a significant movement, and they were missionaries who embarked on their separate small group expeditions from that year until 1839. The initial pioneers on this path were the Lee brothers, Jason and Daniel, who blazed the trail. The following year, Samuel Parker and Marcus Whitman traversed the long route. In 1836, Whitman, having returned to the east, came back with his wife, Mr. and Mrs. Spaulding, and W.G. Gray. It is said that when they reached the trapper's gathering point at Sweetwater, these pioneering white women received a warm welcome from the assembled mountain men, who escorted them a considerable distance on their journey. The rest of the way, they traveled under the protective escort of the American Fur Company. The 1838 group included Mr. and Mrs. Walker, Mr. and Mrs. Eels, and Mr. and Mrs. Smith. In 1839, Mr. and Mrs. Griffin, accompanied by Mr. and Mrs. Munger, made the arduous trek. These dedicated missionaries toiled diligently in the Oregon Territory, with some of them making the ultimate sacrifice for their faith. A few years later, Dr. Whitman embarked on a heroic journey across the mountains and plains during the harsh winter, enduring incredible hardships, to deliver the news of British encroachments on American settlements along the Columbia River to Washington. 
The Northwest owes a great debt to his selflessness and patriotism. Not long after these early Protestant missionaries, Catholic missionaries arrived on the scene. One such figure was P.J. DeSmet, a Jesuit, who under the orders of his superior came to the Upper Missouri in 1840 to minister to Indian tribes. His life was henceforth dedicated to their service. The early history of Catholic missions in the Northern Rockies is primarily the chronicle of one devoted missionary, Father DeSmet. He embarked on extensive journeys across the plains and mountains and eloquently documented his experiences. He held a special place in the hearts of the Native Americans, and his visits as the Black Robe were always warmly received in their dwellings. His most significant efforts were focused on the Salish tribe. In 1841, a pivotal moment arrived when the first group of settlers began their arduous journey across the plains and mountains to reach Oregon and California. Unlike those who had traversed the region before, driven by wanderlust and lacking a firm intention to establish roots in this new land, these were true settlers. Among them were men, women, and children, and their gradual westward migration signaled the start of a new and definitive era. They proceeded slowly along the Platte Valley, with the only notable stopover along those vast distances being the rustic fur trader's fort on the Laramie River. These were the genuine pioneers, and they were few in number, consisting of only 15 individuals. They included Joel P. Walker, his wife, sister, three sons and two daughters, Mr. Burroughs, along with his wife and child, Mr. Warfield, accompanied by his wife and child, and a man named Nichols. The sense of solitude, the apprehensions, and the marvels of that journey were particularly felt by the women and children as they peered out from under the wagon covers during those trying months, a perspective that is challenging to fully grasp. Close behind them toiled over the same dim trail Bidwell's company bound for California, but at Fort Bridger, this party turned more directly west, following the route later made famous by the gold hunters. Mrs. Kelsey was the only woman in the Bidwell company. So in the same year, the first emigrants passed over the long trails to Oregon and California. Starting from this point, the flow of settlers steadily grew. In 1842, a group of 112 individuals, including men, women, and children, led by Elijah White, successfully journeyed to the Columbia River. Their convoy consisted of 18 large wagons from Pennsylvania, pulled by cattle, pack mules, and horses. The following year witnessed the passage of a substantial migration, with a force of a thousand men, women, and children. They brought with them draft cattle, herds of cows and horses, farming tools and household belongings. This moment marked the beginning of the end for the old way of life. Never again would the plains and mountains resemble what they once were. The era of permanent settlement had dawned. Subsequent to these early pioneers, there arrived the significant Mormon migration of 1847. It's challenging to capture the scale of this movement, which included thousands of individuals from various walks of life, spanning men, women, and children. They carried all their earthly possessions and embarked on a journey across the expansive plains that lasted for months in search of a new home. They ultimately found it in the deserts of Utah. Driven out of Illinois by irate citizens and abandoning a deserted city, this assembly of religious enthusiasts, led by Brigham Young, faced the hardships of an Iowa exodus, enduring the severe cold of winter and the spring floods. They persevered until they established their second winter camp on the banks of the Elkhorn River in Nebraska. Nonetheless, this pause was merely a brief intermission. On April 9, 1847, the vanguard set out westward with the expectation that all others would follow as promptly as possible. The expedition was well provisioned, with each group receiving a wagon, two oxen, two milking cows, and a tent for every ten individuals. In each wagon, there were rations that included 1,000 pounds of flour, 50 pounds of rice, sugar, and bacon, 30 pounds of beans, 20 pounds of dried apples or peaches, 25 pounds of salt, 5 pounds of tea, a gallon of vinegar, and 10 bars of soap. Every able-bodied man was required to carry a firearm and participate in guard duty. The wagon served multiple purposes as beds, kitchens, and sometimes even makeshift boats. They covered an average of 13 miles per day. 
It took the advance party three months to reach the Great Salt Lake Valley, the chosen site for their new home as designated by their leader. Behind them, in extensive caravans that stretched almost continuously from the distant shores of the Missouri River, labored the devoted followers of the Prophet. This passage of the Disciples of the Church of Latter-day Saints across the wilderness stands as one of the most remarkable spectacles witnessed on the Great Plains. While it might have been equaled and perhaps even surpassed in terms of sheer numbers, a few years later by the rush of gold seekers to California, when one considers the distinctions in organization and purpose, this enormous exodus remains virtually unparalleled in history. Furthermore, this peculiar migration didn't come to a halt with the initial pioneers. Dedicated missionaries of the faith worked tirelessly in the eastern states and Europe, and their numerous converts, usually lacking in worldly possessions but overflowing with religious fervor, continued to journey westward in an unending flow across the prairies, right up to the advent of the railroads. The tide of migration never entirely ceased. Thousands crossed the Great Plains while pulling handcarts laden with their belongings, although the church authorities provided wagons for the women, children, and those who were unwell. These handcarts were simple yet robust, consisting of five-foot-long hickory or oak shafts with cross pieces. Beneath the cart's bed, there was a wooden axle tree, and the wheels were constructed of wood with a light iron band. The entire weight averaged around 60 pounds. For every 100 individuals, the church supplied 20 handcarts, five tents, three or four milking cows, and a wagon drawn by three yokes of oxen. The amount of clothing and bedding brought along was restricted to 17 pounds per person, with each handcart expected to carry roughly 100 pounds of freight. The majority of this massive group from the church embarked on their westward journey from Council Bluffs, Iowa, making their way up the Platte River Valley by following a trail etched deeply into the prairie soil. However, there were offshoot routes originating from points further south. The most frequently used of these led from Independence, Missouri, northwest across the plains, eventually converging with the primary stream of travelers at Grand Island, Nebraska. This route soon gained prominence for emigrant parties bound for California and Oregon, and later it became a path raced over by overland stagecoaches and the Pony Express. Other groups of Mormons, although typically smaller in size, advanced up the Arkansas River Valley and skirted along the eastern base of the Rockies during their lengthy journey to the Promised Land. One such party was responsible for bringing the first American families to what is now Colorado, where they settled on the site of Pueblo for the duration of the winter in 1846 to 47. During the course of their journey through the wilderness, these travelers faced many hardships and sufferings. However, there are no recorded instances of Indian attacks. Exposure and death took a toll on many along the trails. One particularly large company, with around a thousand miles left to traverse, made the bold decision to continue their journey as late as the end of November, braving the harsh plains and mountain winter. Initially, they were covering 15 miles a day, but they soon experienced setbacks such as broken axles and other mishaps. A cattle stampede at Wood River resulted in the loss of 30 head. The beef cattle, milch cows, and heifers were harnessed, but contributed little to their progress. As a result, the food ration was reduced to just one meal a day. Upon reaching Laramie, Wyoming, their hope of securing provisions was in vain. Once again, they were forced to reduce rations. Able-bodied men were allocated a mere 12 ounces of flour daily, while women and elderly men received 9 ounces, and children had 4 to 8 ounces. The weather grew increasingly harsh, and the bitter cold took a heavy toll. They were faced with the formidable sight of the snow-covered mountains ahead. The elderly and infirm began to succumb, turning each camp into a makeshift burial ground. Then the able-bodied individuals started dropping, with some perishing in the harnesses of their carts. While they were still a daunting 16 miles away from the nearest possible camp on the Sweetwater River, it began to snow, and they issued their last ration of flour. At this moment of despair, messengers arrived bearing news that a supply train was only two or three days ahead. Encouraged by this glimmer of hope, the survivors managed to press onward, but five souls succumbed to the cold and exhaustion during the night. The next morning, they awoke to find the snow a foot deep, and they had only two barrels of biscuits, a small quantity of sugar, dried apples, and a 
quarter of a sack of rice left. They decided to stay in camp, sending their captain and one of the elders ahead to search for the supply train. During those three excruciating days of waiting, the party endured unbearable suffering. Many fell ill and perished. One account reports, some expired in the arms of those who were themselves almost at the point of death. Mothers wrapped with their dying hands the remnant of their tattered clothing around the wan forms of their perishing infants. The most pitiful sight of all was to see strong men begging for the morsel of food that had been set aside for the sick and helpless. Late in the night of the third day, the help so long waited to reach them. Yet it came almost too late to save. In Inman's words, some were already beyond all human aid, some had lost their reason, and around others the blackness of despair had settled, all efforts to arouse them from their stupor being unavailing. Each day the weather grew colder and many were frostbitten, losing fingers, toes, or ears. One sick man, who held onto the wagon bars to avoid jolting, having all his fingers frozen. At a camping ground at Willow Creek, 15 people were buried, 13 of them frozen to death. Beyond this point, the weather became more moderate, and upon their arrival in Salt Lake, the struggling group had a death toll of 67 out of 420 people. Martin's party, comprising 600 individuals, followed a few miles behind and also suffered significantly, particularly along the North Platte River, but with less severe loss of life. While it's challenging to estimate the exact number of individuals who participated in the Mormon migration, some figures shed light on its significance. The initial scouting party, personally led by Brigham Young, consisted of 143 men and an accompanying train of 73 wagons. They were followed by a group of 1,200 men, women and children with 397 wagons. The Kimball Company consisting of 662 people and 226 wagons and those under the charge of Richards, totaling 526 individuals with 169 wagons. Simultaneously, migration to Oregon was steadily on the rise. In 1849, 1,400 Mormons passed Fort Bridger. An interesting aspect of these early migrations is that few, if any, paused along the way. Not even rumors of gold deposits in the Black Hills or the Bighorn Range could deter the steady flow of pioneers headed toward Salt Lake and the Pacific. Occasionally, a few adventurers were diverted, but their findings, if any, left no discernible mark on history. An example of this is the tale of 30 men who deserted Captain Douglas's party in 1852. They had set out to prospect in the Black Hills, but disappeared without a trace. It was likely that they met their demise at the hands of Native Americans.